Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Unleavened Bread Bible Studies with David Eels. Greetings, folks. God bless you. In Jesus' name, thank you for joining us. I was just thinking of a wonderful prayer we could pray <clears throat> here today. We've been talking about the the real good news, the wonderful good news, and I thought about Paul's prayer in Ephesians, which is just awesome. Let me let me read it to you, and let this let this be our prayer today. Okay. Um, verse sixteen. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling." what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of the strength of his might, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him to sit on his right hand in heavenly places. Wow, awesome. Well, Father, that's our prayer, Lord that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you, and that we would have our eyes enlightened, our spiritual eyes enlightened, to know what is the hope of our calling. In other words, Father, what you have given unto us, just the all-inclusive salvation that you've given unto us, Lord, make us to know this. Open our understanding today and make us to know this. Lord, we thank you. This prayer is our prayer today, Lord, that you would give us these gifts. Thank you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, I think I'm just going to go on with what we've been talking about, and that is the real good news that the Lord has given unto us and um, that the Lord would help us to understand how deep and broad and, and what his power is to those who believe these things. You know, Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. It is important what we believe. As you have believed, so shall it be unto you. It is important what we believe. It is important what we know because faith is based on knowledge. And you can't believe for something that you don't know about. So we've been looking at just how deep and broad this river of salvation is. We discovered that um, the promises of God concerning salvation in personal soul salvation and in healing, body salvation, and in deliverance and in protection and provision, and um, that all of these promises are past tense. Um by whose stripes ye were healed, that he bare your sins in his body upon the tree. He delivered you out of the power of darkness. He made you free from sin. They're all past tense so that we can enter into his rest, his all-inclusive New Testament rest. And um, the rest mentioned in, in Hebrews you know, speaks of ceasing from our own works, Hebrews chapter 4, through faith in his promises. And, uh, you know, we need to walk in that rest and in that peace so that we're not condemned of the devil, separated from the faith of God, separated from the things that God wants to do through us. We need to walk in that rest. All provision has been made in our New Testament Sabbath rest. 
or sabbatismos as it's called in Hebrews 4, which means a continual rest. It's not one day that we rest anymore, folks. We have to cease from our works and enter into his rest through faith every day. That's his promise. And, um, you know, I'm going to turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 31 just for a moment. The Lord is about to bring the church, and I, I might say he's bringing individuals in the church through their own personal wilderness so that they can come to know how to live by faith. The righteous shall live from faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. We are not of those that shrink back unto perdition, but of those who have faith unto the saving of the soul. You know what your soul is? It's your mind, your will, your emotions. It's your nature. It's your character. Um, Jesus Christ is an example of a saved soul. Walking in his steps is something that he has provided for us to do. And everyone who abides in him walks as he walked. That's what John said. Well, I'm going to start in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 23. It says, Behold, the tempest of the Lord, even his wrath, is gone forth. A sweeping tempest, it shall burst upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days you shall understand it. Well, now at least we ought to understand that we're living in the latter days and that there have been other latter days, but we're living in the latter days. So this has got to be a type and a shadow for us. And um, chapter 31 starts, although there wasn't a 31 there in the original, it just went right on, you see. So it says, at that time. So we, we're still talking about the latter days here. At that time saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel? Well, we've, we've spoken about the families of Israel as in the end time, those who are grafted into the olive tree in Romans chapter 11, which he called all Israel. He grafted in the church. He broke off the unbelieving Jews concerning the, the, the new kingdom. He broke them off. He grafted in the Gentiles. He grafted in the church. And then he said, and so all Israel shall be saved. That's in Romans chapter 11, if you want to look at it. So all the families of Israel here is a very large group of people around the world, not just natural Israel. And they shall be my people. They shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people that were left of the sword found favor in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. What's the wilderness got to do with the rest? Well, we know that um, the wilderness is a very sparse place, very little provision there for man, very little worldly provision for man. And um, in the wilderness, the Israelites, of course, had to have salvation from God. They had to have provision from God. They had to have protection from God. Uh, the righteous shall live from faith. And so God was bringing them to a perfect place where they could learn to trust in him if they would have. He put, he made this as an opportunity for them. And um, in that wilderness, of course, God himself had to ultimately save them because they ran out of all their provision from Egypt, which is a type of the world. And um, there was no natural provision around them. They were basically at the mercy of God. Well, what we've shared already in, in our series here is that when you believe these past tense promises, you automatically enter into a wilderness because there is no help from man because the, the promises are past tense. God's already healed. He's already delivered you. He's already healed you. He's already uh, provided for you and protected you and all these things, saved your soul, all these things. He's already done all these things. So th therefore, you can't do anything to bring them to pass because he's already done them. You just enter into the rest, according to what Hebrews says. In Hebrews 4 and 3, for we who have believed do enter into that rest. We're resting from what? 
we're resting from our own works to bring to pass what God said has already been done. As I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. See, in other words, God's saying is, why shouldn't you rest? The works are already finished. And the problem is that people who don't walk by faith in the promises are quickly drug away from them. If you go back, for instance, in uh, verse 18, chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that were disobedient? And we see that they were not able to enter in because of unbelief. So, you want to know where disobedience comes from? It comes from unbelief. Because when you believe the promises, you rest. You are at peace. You are trusting in God to bring it to pass, and you're ceasing from your works. What are your works? Your works are disobedience. Your works, works of the flesh, are disobedience. They're sin. Your works, works of the law in the new covenant, are disobedience. They're sin. So you see that, that um, unbelief brings disobedience. Matter of fact, here in chapter 4, the word apethia is used twice, and it could be translated either way because it means both disobedience and unbelief. How could that be? Well, let's see. I'm um, going to point out verse... Verse 12, no, verse 11. Let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest that no man fall after the same example of disobedience, apethia, which means also unbelief, unbelief or disobedience. Why would it be the, the same word? And here in verse 6, seeing therefore it remaineth that some should enter therein and they to whom the good tidings were before preached fail to enter in because of apethia, disobedience or unbelief. You see, if, you're, if you have unbelief, you will be disobedient. No, one reason is, is you cannot cease from your own works when you don't believe God's already done it. You always want to help him out. Or you fall victim to fear and, and uh, doubt and discouragement and everything that happens because people live by what they see with their physical eyes rather than what they see in the book. In other words, they get their eyes on the world and on the problems, and they fall victim to those things. And if you walk by sight, you will not walk by faith. Okay, I'd like to share with you something out of um, Numbers chapter 21. Unbelief brings disobedience. You can't help it. Because if you're not walking by faith, you're walking by sight. If you're walking by sight and you're looking at the problems around you, for instance, the Israelites in the wilderness, what did they see around them? They saw a lack. They became fearful because they didn't believe that God was able to meet their every need out there in that place. And uh, the devil, of course, agreed with them. And uh, so they were full of fear, full of discouragement, and full of disobedience, and rebelled against the Lord, spoke against the Lord. It's the only thing you've got left if you don't have faith. Okay? Let's, let's read this story and maybe pick out a few things. It says in verse 4, And they journeyed from Mount Hor by way to the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, and there is no water, and our soul loatheth this light bread or this vile bread. And what were they speaking about? Well, they were speaking about the manna, this vile bread. They're, they didn't, you know, the, the bread of life 
is, as we were speaking a little earlier in our, our um, um, earlier broadcast, the bread of life is bitter in the belly. It's sweet to the tongue, sweet to the taste, but bitter in the belly. And uh, in other words, the flesh just doesn't like it because it demands your life. It demands you give up your thinking. It demands you give up your ways. It demands submission. And uh, so these people, because they were discouraged, because they were walking by sight, because they had their eyes on the problems around them instead of on the promise, they became discouraged and they spoke against the Lord. You know that that's all you can do when you walk by sight and fill your, your computer with uh, what you see around you rather than what the Word of the Lord says. As we've already studied and seen, uh, God's already taken care of every problem you can imagine, every problem that you could possibly have. It's all been covered by the blood. It's all been covered by the Lord on the cross. He's already taken it away. It's already solved. It is finished. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, he told his disciples. It's already solved. If we keep our eyes on those promises, they bring us rest. If we get our eyes on the problem, we stumble and we fall. I remember um, there was this lady years ago that, that we had really struggled with for many years to, to minister to her, to bring the word of the Lord to her, to help st stabilize her in the word. and uh, But she always would go back to walking by sight and speaking against the Lord. You know what speaking against the Lord can be? It can be anything that's contrary to the word, that's contrary to confessing the good confession in the sight of many witnesses, contrary to uh, with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, our salvation in every form uh, comes by not only faith, but the works that come from faith. And the biggest work that comes from faith is what we say. And uh, so anyway, my wife, we were ministering to this lady and the Lord would talk to us with dreams and visions for this lady constantly, you know. And um, one time my wife got a, a dream and the dream was that um, that she was in a bunk bed with this lady. She was on the top bunk, and this lady was on the lower bunk, and they were just resting, except for one thing. She was resting. My wife was resting, but this lady was just tossing and turning, and all of her covers and everything on her bed was all in a knot. It was all twisted up, and she just wasn't comfortable. And... Um, and then my wife heard her say things like, I'm just so afraid. I just can't do it. Uh, and it was just a lot of negative things were coming out of her mouth, you know. And my wife knew that the name of this place was, was holiness, this place where they were. It was holiness. And, but she also knew that the only way you could stay there was um, to confess the Lord there. So this lady started saying all these negative things, and, and my wife said she looked over the end of the bunk down at her, and she said, no, nope, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. She kept correcting her, you know, about, about saying things that were against the Lord, against the Bible, you know. And finally the lady said, well, I just don't know if I want to stay here. Well, you know, folks, you, you can't stay in the place of holiness unless you're going to agree with the Word of God. How can two walk together except they be agreed, the Bible says. So we have to learn to confess the Lord in the midst of the situations around us. They were in a what appeared to be a desperate situation around them, but the Lord had already solved this problem. He brought them there on purpose. He brought them there to try them, to see if they'd walk by sight or walk by faith. And... You know, the Bible tells us in, uh, in Matthew 10 and 32, Jesus said that if we confess him before men, he will confess us before the Father. He says, verse 32, Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven.
You know, we we believe by faith his promises. They give us rest. And what naturally comes out of our mouth is agreement with the word of God. And uh, when you confess him before men, he confesses you before the Father. The word confess here is the word homo legeo. It means to speak the same as. See, when we when we are in the tribulations of our wilderness experiences, we see our need, we see our lack, we see our, our sickness, we see uh, you know a, a sin, we see our problems, all these things which we've just discovered the Lord's already taken care of. Now, are we going to agree with the gospel, the good news? Well, with the heart believing unto righteousness and with the mouth confessing unto salvation. It's very important that we confess in order to bring the salvation that we're believing for. We're calling the things that be not as though they were. It's very important that we confess him before men, that we say before men what his word says. You know, Jesus is called in Hebrews 3 and 1, the high priest of our confession. He offers an offering before the Father. And that offering is what we say. And if we say what he says, speak the same as, then he confesses us before the Father and in another ver another gospel before the holy angels. So, um, now I like uh, chapter 12 and verse 36 also. It says, And I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. You know, there are many days of judgment, folks. We come into days of judgment, thank God, so that we don't have to come into the day of judgment. But our idle words, the word means unfruitful. There are unfruitful words uh, don't give us any help in the day of judgment. It says... Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified. That means accounted righteous. And by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Now when you come into judgment, do you want to be condemned? Or do you want to be justified so that you come through it, you overcome it, so on and so forth? Well, of course. Well, he tells us that in order for that to happen, we have to confess him before men. And I like uh, 15, chapter 15 and verse um, 18. It says, But the things which proceed out of the mouth come forth out of the heart. They defile the man. For out of the mouth, or excuse me, out of the heart, come forth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, railings, um, these things which defile the man, but uh, to eat with unwashing hands defileth not the man. So when we think thoughts that are contrary to God, when we uh, speak what we see, feel, and hear, like the, um, like the, uh, uh, the witnesses who went in to witness the, uh, the promised land, uh, who brought back a bad report, they brought back what they saw, what they felt, and what they heard. They were condemned by God, and they died in the wilderness because they made the hearts of the people uh, fearful, and uh, they made them fall away. So these men died in the wilderness because they brought a bad report. They did bring a report of what they saw, what they felt, and what they heard. But our report, the good report that we're supposed to give, the good witness that we give, the good confession that we give before men has to be what thus saith the Lord. What did the Lord say about this circumstance and what about this situation? Uh, by your words, you're going to be justified, accounted righteous. By your words, you're going to be condemned. So when in the wilderness, when these folks uh, begin to look at the problems around them, and got discouraged because they didn't have their mind on the promise, they spoke against the Lord. What did they do? Well, they spoke about what they saw, what they felt, what they heard, and what their fears told them would happen. And, uh, you know, they cried the whole time to go back to Egypt by the flesh pots because they want, they loved the, the fleshly rest of trusting in the world to supply their needs. 
And yet God wanted to take away all, any kind of fleshly rest. He wanted them to rest in the spirit, rest in the promises and uh, in the wilderness. So he brought them out there for that very purpose. He had to bring them through the wilderness to get them to the promised land. And of course they weren't worthy to live in the promised land unless they went through the wilderness and, um, and confessed him in the midst of those trials. So we see here that um, the people spake against the Lord. And what comes from, first of all, unbelief, which brings disobedience, what comes from that? Well, they spake against the Lord, um, that he was going to cause them to die in the wilderness, and how much they hated the bread, you know. And what did that bring? Well, it, it brought a curse upon them. The Lord spent, sent uh, fiery serpents among the people, um, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. It brought the curse. You know, they hated the light bread. They hated the Lord. You know, if you hate the Word, if you don't love the Word, you don't love the Lord. People, Many people say they love the Lord. Uh, but what did the Lord himself say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love the Lord, you love the Word. You know what the, the light bread here was the manna. What was that? Well, I'll give you an example. In Exodus chapter 16, it says in verse 31, The house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And some of you probably have a note there that the word manna is actually the word, the Hebrew word man. Man. Wow. They call the name of it man. Well, who is the man? Well, Jesus is the man. He said he was the bread that came down out of heaven that gave life to the world. You know, they hated the manna, which represented the word of life, and it represented he who is the word, who is Jesus Christ. They hated the Lord. You know, the Lord, the Lord is these promises. He is the word made flesh. For us to be like him, for us to bear his fruit, we too have to be the Word made flesh, the Word manifested in flesh, right? That's, that's God's plan, that he might come, that he might reveal himself through the body of Christ like he revealed himself through the first body of Christ. So because they hated the Lord, because they became discouraged, because they had their eyes on the problems instead of on the promises and had no rest, they had not entered into the rest. They had not ceased from their works. They were under the curse. And so the Bible says that God sent these fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. You know, um, I remember as I was growing up, my daddy had an old saying. I never did really understand it until I began to read the Bible. But... Um, he would talk about people who just always had problems, always, you know, uh, what was what was the old term they used to use about these people? Um, um, jinxed, jinxed was the word I think I remember now. But my daddy used to call them snake bit. He called them snake bit. That was his his term. He always said, and and I didn't understand. I you know I didn't understand exactly what he was saying until I started reading this and and I realized that snake bit represents you know somebody that's just under the curse they fall into the curse here and there all everywhere they go they fall into the curse and the main reason is because <clears throat> they don't believe the word of God you know they don't have their eyes on the the savior they have their eyes on the problem and because of that their heart just melts their heart is not strong before the lord and they get discouraged, and they get fearful, and they're full of doubt. And uh, the promises 
You know, having therefore these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The promises give us power over the flesh, power to change things. Well, the Lord sent these fiery serpents among them, and <clears throat> they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, because we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. They sinned, because they spoke against the Lord. Do you know how common it is for God's people to speak against him? Because their tongue is connected to their physical sight and their physical hearing and what they see in the physical realm and not to the Word of God? It's overwhelmingly common, but it's also common that God's people live under the curse. But the Lord didn't ordain us to live under the curse. He ordained us to live above the curse. They spoke against the Lord. You know what God told uh, Joshua? Let me read that to you. Joshua chapter 1. He said in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou shalt make thy way prosperous. In other words, the word, agreement with the word, not necessarily quoting the word, but agreement with the word, will not depart out of your, your mouth, then your way will be prosperous. Then, what did he say would happen? You would observe to do according to all that's written therein. <clears throat> you see, faith um, makes us obedient. Unbelief makes us disobedient. Uh, unbelief meaning apithia, same word for disobedience. See, faith makes us obedient. Unbelief makes us disobedient. We will never cease from our works. We will never enter into the rest unless we believe. That's what he exhorted in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 3. That he swear in his wrath they would never enter into his rest. Why? Because they had an evil heart of unbelief. An evil heart of unbelief. So this is how we prosper in going to the promised land, you know. And um, they spoke against the Lord, and they realized that this was sin. And he asked, they asked the, uh, Moses to pray for them. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a standard, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he seeth it, shall live. So the fiery serpent, what does that represent? Well, you know what? <clears throat> we came out of this world into the kingdom of God, into what's called the body of Christ. What, what, what body were we a part of before we came to the body of Christ? Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. He talked to the Pharisees. He said, you're sons of your father, the devil. They were members of the body of the devil. You know, the serpent um, is what we used to be a body. We were used to be in that, in that body. Uh, we were being created in his image and we were, um, actually full of the poison of the serpent. We had that poison in our heads, you know, just like the serpent does. And yet the Lord called us to be his, a part of his body. You know, the old serpent, the devil, right? And um, so, but the thing is, the Bible says that Jesus became like that serpent. You know, from now on, what we can see when we look at Jesus upon the cross, is we can see our problem put there. You see, we can see our curse put there upon him. We can see our sin put there upon him. We can see the uh, our sickness put there upon him. We can see our lack put there upon him. We can see all of the curse put upon him. And, you know, if we look at Galatians chapter 3 and 
uh, verse 13, it says, Christ redeemed us. That that um, is a word exagorazo, and it means to, to buy out or to purchase a slave uh, with a mind to set him free. Okay? So <clears throat> Christ redeemed us. He bought us. He, d he delivered us from bondage, from slavery to the devil and to the curse. He delivered us. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is all of the evil things that came upon mankind for disobeying God's law. He redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He became the curse. Well, who is it that administers the curse, by the way? It's the devil. The devil administers the curse. He's given that authority by God to do it, to cause people to repent, to turn to him. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Now we see that Jesus became cursed. He became like the serpent. You see? That upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That upon the Gentiles might come the blessing of Abraham. Abraham was blessed in all things, the Bible says. And um, it says in verse 16, to Abraham were the promises spoken, and to his seed. Um, he saith not as to seeds as of many, but as to but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. God made all these promises to Christ, just to one seed. Now, we must abide in him. We abide in him by accepting the same promises, by speaking the same promises, by walking by faith in the same promises. This is how we abide in him. And we have received the benefit of Abraham because Jesus became cursed for us. God put our curse upon him. He put the whole curse that's enumerated in Deuteronomy 28, he put it upon Jesus. No matter what problem you got, you should be able to see this problem upon Jesus. The Lord had Moses make a fiery serpent and set it upon a standard that every one that is bitten, when he seeth it, shall live. When he seeth it, shall live. Uh, another thing, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 21 him who knew no sin he made to be sin he became the curse and he became the sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him got a problem with sin Got a problem with the curse that comes from sin. Well, we see here the serpent on the pole, the serpent on the standard, the serpent on the cross. We see here that the Lord has put all of this upon Jesus. Now, what are we to confess if we get our eyes on the serpent on the pole, if we get our eyes on the fact that the Lord Jesus has borne all this away and we are what Corinthians says here in chapter 5, uh, new creatures, verse 17. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, they are become new. All of that curse, all of that sin, that's all passed away. We're now new creatures. That's what we're supposed to see. When you look at the serpent on the pole, you see your curse, your sin upon him. The curse is very broad. If you read Deuteronomy 28, it's all sickness. It's all lack. It's all bondage to your enemies. It's all these things. And it's all been put upon Jesus Christ. And what are we to confess? What we see in the world or what we see on the cross? See, we're speaking against God if we're not speaking in agreement with his promises. We must repent. We must change our mind. That's what repent means. We're new creatures in Christ. You know, and the Bible says, of course, in, um, in um, John chapter 3, 
that as the serpent was raised up on the pole, so Christ was raised up for our salvation, right? So since Christ has been raised up on the pole for our salvation and we are to get our eyes upon him because he said everyone who looks upon him, everyone that seeth it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and set it upon a standard, verse 9, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he looked unto the serpent of brass, he lived. You know, the I think it's the American Medical Association that has claimed the serpent on the pole as their symbol. But the serpent on the pole represents the fact that God already healed you. Not that God is going to use some modern method to heal you. It's that he already healed you. You see, that's totally contrary. They're, they cannot claim that is God's method. God's method is calling the things that be not as though they were, you see. And it's by grace. It's unearned. It's unmerited. You don't have to pay for it, you see. The serpent on the pole is the fact that we can look at Jesus and we can see that our sickness has already been put upon him and we don't have to accept it. That's the good news, the really good news. Okay, And, of course, Jesus and his disciples used that method all through the Scriptures. They didn't use the things that are to bring to nothing the things that are. They used the things that are not to bring to nothing the things that are, the promises which claim that we're already healed. So when they got their eyes on the sun, which in this case is the serpent, they got their eyes on what the sun had accomplished, they were healed. The Son of God bore all this curse, and we are healed. You know, many years ago, I got a vision. I saw myself walking to this stream, And um, I got into the stream, and I got a revelation that as long as I laid on my back and looked at the sun, I could stay floating up on the stream. And um, I, as I meditated on that, the Lord gave me the answer to it. And of course, the thing is that when I was laying in this stream, I was floating upstream as I watched the sun, as I kept my eyes on the sun, I floated upstream and I laid floating upon my back. And I realized that this stream represents the Word of God. You know, the, what God told Moses, he said, I set before you this day a blessing and a cursing. You know, he was talking about his commandments, that they are both a blessing and a cursing. They represent the curse of death and they represent the blessing of uh, God's good news, you see. So it depends on how you deal with these words, these promises, as to what you're going to meet in your future, right? Well, I realized that this water represented the Word of God, the washing of the water with the Word, and that it could either kill me or give me life. It's either a blessing or a cursing. And I realized that I could go contrary to, to nature, if I keep my eyes on the sun, I would always stay afloat. I would always stay above the curse. No water, if you go beneath it, will kill you, right? But if you stay on top, it's a blessing. And Noah, of course, stayed on top, right? And the cursed went beneath, and they died underneath the, um, the waters of that flood, okay? So to stay above the curse that's upon this world... We have to keep our eyes on the sun. Why is that? Well, because he's the one that promised, and he's the one that bore the curse. And we should be able to see our curse upon him. What problem do you have right now? Can you see that having been put upon the Lord Jesus? If you can, 
then you can be free of it. That's his method. It's very, very simple. So simple that a babe can do it, right? That's what faith is all about. Faith is believing you have received on account of the promises that God has already given. Well, as I was laying on my back with my face to the sun, floating upstream, contrary to the way of the world, contrary to nature, contrary to the laws of this world. See, everybody wants things to be natural, but I tell you what, if you keep your eyes on the sun, it's supernatural. It's above the laws of this world. They take precedent over the laws of this world. Healing comes to people who believe that they've received it. But it's very hard to come to people who are seeking for it all the time. Deliverance from sin, same thing. Every other curse, same way, same thing. Believe you have received, Jesus said. All things whatsoever you pray and ask for, believe ye received them, and you shall have them. That's very simple, folks, and very cheap, too. <laughs> you know, it's an awesome benefit that the Lord has given to us. So I realized that when I was floating upstream, I looked around me and I saw that there were other people, a few others that were doing the same thing, floating upstream. And as we floated a ways, I, I noticed that there were people on the left side of the stream that floated up underneath this tent that was stretched over the stream. It stretched over about half of the stream there, a tent. And when these people who were floating with me went up underneath this tent and the shadow fell upon them, they sunk. And uh, I quickly got out on the bank. I cut the ropes that were holding the tent up. It fell into the water. The water carried it away. And I made these floats to float these people up off the bottom. Once they saw the sun again, they started floating again. See, once they got their eyes back on the sun again, they started floating again. I realized that what the tent represented was man's religion. You know, they like to take a lot of credit for what God has already done. They like to tell men that, Oh, God doesn't do it that way these days, you know. They like to have their fleshly ideas, but basically what they're doing is let's go back to Egypt. Let's do it the way of the world. Let's, let's have God's salvation through man. Let's have man's provision. Let's go back by the flesh pots. They basically didn't teach people to walk by faith with their eyes on the sun, but... They brought them into darkness. They blocked the light of the sun. And so the people sink. They're under the curse. And they think it's normal down there under the curse to live under the curse of this world. I mean, obviously everybody around them is living that way. But God didn't ordain us to do that. If we keep our eyes on the sun, we'll stay above the curse. Well, that's what the Lord revealed to me about this. And... Um, you know, years ago, when the Lord was giving me a vision about moving over to here to Pensacola, um, he gave me a vision. Uh, the vision was that my wife and myself were sitting in our front lawn in some lawn chairs. We were just resting, taking it easy. And as we looked out the front, we saw the power lines going by on the street and these power lines were sagging in between the poles until they almost touched the ground and then they went back up and as we were looking at this scene a tornado came and just picked us up out of our chairs and carried us away and I saw this all very clearly um, the Lord interpreted this for me and the interpretation was that as we ceased from our own works, we rested, we entered into the rest, um, the power of God, the power of man was coming to an end. The power line was sagging, almost touching the ground. The power of man would come to the end in our life, meaning, of course, our efforts, our ability to save ourselves, you know, was coming to an end. But the power of God which is likened unto the whirlwind in the scriptures, 
when the power of man came to an end, the power of God came and just picked us up out of our chairs and carried us away. And literally that happened. I mean, not literally as far as the tornado and all that, you know, but supernaturally the Lord moved us from where we were over to here, provided everything, you know, bought our house, bought our car, opened doors, everything. He did it all. It was supernatural. Well, there was another part to the vision. The other part to the vision was when I came down, I was by this this church. Eh, it wasn't any particular church. It was just like a lot of churches, like the tent over the water, you know. I walked through the door, and I saw an old man standing in the foyer of the church there. And I knew that this guy was dangerous. <laughs> so I, so I kind of hugged the wall. I got it, went around him just like he was a rattlesnake. You know, like if he bit me, I would die, you know. So I just kind of hugged the wall, got around him, and went on into what they call the sanctuary a lot of times. I knew that this old man was the preacher. And uh, I went into the sanctuary, and there was this big double sink. I saw it right in the middle of the sanctuary. It was full of water, and it was full of babies. And I ran over to the sink, and I started pulling these babies up out of the water. Most of these babies were dead. And I pulled one up, and I held him face up. You know, they were all face down in the water, and they were dead. And I held him face up, and he said, Thank God we knew he was going to send someone. And, you know, the thing was, face down or face up, the Lord pointed out to me, face down in the water is, is people who have their eyes on the world. They have their eyes on the curse, and they're dying because of it. Face up towards the sun is facing what the Lord has provided, what the Lord became a curse for us. He became sin for us. He made reconciliation. Our curse was put upon him. His blessing was put upon us. Reconciliation means an exchange. He made an exchange. Well, most of these babies were already dead. I knew that the preacher was the one that was guilty of this. He was using the water to try to clean up the babies, but he had their eyes on the world and not on the sun. One was spared because his eyes were upon the sun. Well, that's what this story is all about, you know. Um, the Lord Jesus, if we will keep our eyes on the Son, on the Word of God, on the promise, we'll enter into the rest, which is ceasing from our own works. If we don't, we're going to look at the problems in the world, and we're going to be forced through fear and doubt and unbelief to fall in line with the world. Anything but sanctification, you know? You know, Jesus... Um, when he died on the cross and the, um, the soldier speared his side and out of his side came forth the, the blood and the water, right? Well, the water is the, the pale, yellowish liquid that separates from the blood when the blood is clotting. And it's called serum. It's a serum. Now, what do they use a serum for? Well, if you take the serum from an animal that's immune to a snake bite, for instance, or immune to some kind of a toxin. You take the serum from that person and you give it to someone who is under this curse, it delivers them. It's an antitoxin, you see. Jesus showed his immunity to the curse of sin and death. He was the spotless, blemishless lamb that we have to eat in order to partake of the Passover. Remember? What was the Passover? The Passover was the passing over of the curse which fell upon the Egyptians because they had the blood on their doorposts. They walked under the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, now Jesus is immune from the snake bite. Therefore, his serum, which is passed on to us, is to give us immunity. It is to give, it is our antitoxin, so to speak, you know? Yeah, he is the serpent on the pole because he bore the curse. He was the lamb who was sacrificed 
See, they had to sacrifice an animal in order to get the serum, right? In order to save someone, right? Okay. Um, Jesus was the lamb, the spotless lamb of God who was sacrificed so that we could have immunity. Immunity. Why was it that we didn't come into this world with immunity in the first place? Well, you know, there's another uh, thing called an antidote. An antidote is when they give you a little bit of the poison so that your own system builds up, a, a, fights against it and builds up an immunity against it, you see. That's called an antidote. It's kind of like temptation, you know. The more you overcome it, the more immune you become to it. See, the Lord wanted a people who were overcomers. You know, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world was a lamb that was sacrificed for people who had fallen, even from the foundation of the world. So the Lord, from the very beginning, tells us that he knew Adam was going to fall. He knew we would be born into a fallen creation, but that he chose us to be overcomers, you see. We uh we are we we've taken the antidote, you know, we've taken the serum. Uh, Jesus, who became the cursed serpent, uh, who became uh, sin for us, if we get our eyes on Him, He's going to make us immune. He's going to deliver us from this curse. We can walk out from under this curse by coming into agreement with Him. Adam and Eve fell under it because they came out of agreement with Him. Now he's teaching us through faith to come into agreement with promises that are contrary to this world. They're contrary to our sight to say that by his stripes you were healed. That's contrary to what you see in this world. But yet as we call the things that be not as though they were, we become immune. If we find that God gave unto us deliverance from the curse. He gave unto us his divine health that we can claim it, that we can deny what we see with our eyes and agree with what we see in the book, these promises, the manna that they hated so much. If we will come into agreement with that, we're walking with the Lord. We're walking in his steps. We're walking in that immunity. I mean, Exodus chapter 12 is very plain. He delivered us from every plague, every plague. Left no plague out. He set us free, folks, through his sacrifice. You don't have a problem that's not covered by that sacrifice. He set us free. Oh, we can rejoice and we can praise God and, and we need to get our eyes on the Savior. God bless you. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.